so, so, so first of all, thank you very much for the, for the chance to be here. Um, so what I'd like to talk about is doodling, which seems like a, 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 a really uh, trite concept. But what, what I really want to talk about is what mathematics is and why we do mathematics and, and how we do mathematics. And it's, it, it's the sort of thing you don't really see in a class. And you do get a chance to see it in, for example, in the work that you've been doing in RIUs. Uh, and so because ma mathematics, pure and applied, always comes from somewhere. Uh, and, it's, uh, and so I want to see this in, in doodles uh, that I did w uh, when I was small. And I think these are, uh, uh, and it's, I want to tell you some of the mathematics that I realized later that it's connected to. Uh, and it's going to look like play. It's going to look just entertaining. Uh, but to me, it's what mathematics is really about, which is, which is finding patterns in, in nature, uh, explaining them, and extending them. So, uh, and much of ma what mathematics is about, I think the hardest part of being a mathematician, it's something which you, at this point, probably are, are, are appreciating, is it's, it's not answering questions people give you, it's finding the right questions. The most brilliant mathematics often is, it comes when people just simply realize what the right question is to ask, uh, and then the answer is maybe hard, but, but somehow less momentous than, uh, than just asking it. So I want to do that today by finding interesting questions buried in, in everyday doodles. Uh, and I'm going to tell you some of the mathematics that it leads to, some of which is quite deep. And before I, I get going, I want to say that the mathematics it get, gets into is not really in my own field. Uh, some of it will connect to things that I, I do, but most of it doesn't. And so I'm not an expert. I have a lot of questions. I want to mainly talk about questions. I have some answers. But again, I feel this is what mathematicians do. We're not narrow. We should be very happy about asking questions and wondering what stuff that's distant from what we're that from our comfort zone. OK, so let me, let me tell you about this. Uh, let me tell you about the doodle and what it is. So basically, it's, it, it's, it, it's like this, where you're sitting, you're sitting in a lecture, maybe a math lecture, and, you're, and you take out your pen and your board. And so, you just, and so what, what I would do, and this I did from when I was really quite small, uh, is just draw sort of circles around it, right? So draw around an object as close as you can without touching it. And uh, so that's basically what I would do, and I would notice things about it. So before I go, I want, before I go on, I want to just check, in case so many things are going to come out of this, that you're going to think, many of you will think this is somehow contrived. I made up this doodle in order to connect to lots of different things. So let me just ask, how many people in the audience have done a doodle that's essentially like this in the past? Raise your hands in there. OK, so if your hand is not up, you are the strange one. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so one, thing I, so, so one thing I noticed when I was uh, small uh, is, is, the fact that, is the fact that when you, things seem to be getting more uh, rounder and rounder. And so it was kind of a vague question. But of course, that's the kind of question you ask when you're just curious about the world. And when you're five years old, you ask it. And when you're any age, you ask that. So that's the question. Something is happening, and it's not mathematically precise. So, uh, so that's the question I asked, and of course I didn't at age five try to make it precise. But now we want to, uh, of course, we want to try to answer it, this vague question. Uh, or it's not really, well, are they? Well, it seems, it seems like it is. And the why, well, what does why really mean? Well, let's make, our, let's make this precise. So just to set notation, I want to define it uh, as follows, which I'll call the rth neighborhood. So you've got some set in the plane, x. And I want to consider those points which are at most r, uh, r from x. So all those points that are within distance r of x, which I just, of course, formalize. And maybe this is the first thing to just remind ourselves that the question I asked, I knew what this meant as a five-year-old, but this is a formalization of it, but there's no new content in this. I, I wouldn't write it this way. The mathematical language is nothing more than a, uh, uh, is, 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 I mean, that looks fancy, but it's not fancy at all. And then we have a reworded question, which is somewhat more precise, which is if we start off with a, a shape x, and we doodle, and we doodle, and we doodle, and we doodle, does it get, as we doodle more and more, does it become more and more circular? And still the question is vague. We now have, uh, we now have defined this, and then th these, are all kind of, these are all kind of vague. And again, that's OK. This is how science proceeds. You notice something, and then you try to figure out what's going on. You don't come into it with a, uh, it, you know, it doesn't, it shouldn't bother you if you're not sure uh, if you're not sure what actually, what, if you don't know everything at the start, if you even don't know the question precisely at the start. OK. So here's a prior question, which is, and I think this question is, is already, you're forced to ask this question, uh, which is, there's an R in the question. Uh, there, there's an R in the question. Uh, and what, what, how does the R affect the question? So how does the size of the doodle 
affect the question. So, the, so in particular, let's say, uh, let's say I have a shape. Let me get colors for this. OK, so let's say I have a shape. And, uh, and then I do a doodle of size, or let's say you do a doodle of size 1 around it. So all these points are within 1 of the shape. And then, but I instead, what if I instead, um, I'm less coordinated, so I'll do a doodle, doodle of size 2 around the shape. Now, of course, your doodle is inside my doodle. That's an easy one, because your points are within, within distance 1. Uh, but what if you were to do a doodle around your doodle, and you were to do a, do a doodle of size 1 around a doodle of size 1? My question is, how does it compare to my doodle of size 2? And this is, I don't mean this is a rhetorical question. I want you to think about this question and, and, and answer it. Uh, and tell me what you think the answer is. So let me, I'm going to take a vote in a second. Uh, so I'm going to ask you, yeah, how many people think that if you do the doodle, the two small doodles, that that's at least as big as the big doodle? Or how many people think that the, the single big doodle is at least as big? And so in a minute, I'll ask you to vote. And I'll tell you why I want you to vote. Because when you wonder about things, you have to have an opinion. There's nothing wrong with having a wrong idea so long as you're willing to change it when, when confronted with evidence. So this is in science, in experimental science, this is having a hypothesis. Uh, and, so, uh, and so if you have skin in the game, then you can try to see what, what you're saying is right. Whereas if you have no opinion, you just don't even know where to begin, it somehow gets you stuck mathematically. So let me now take the vote. Uh, how many people think that the two small doodles are at least as big? Raise your hand in the air. Okay, how many people think that the single big doodle is at least as big? Raise your hand in the air. Okay, so it's, so, so it's a lot of people voted for both, and then more, it looked like it was roughly a 3 to 2 ratio. Now let me ask, who did not vote? Raise your hand. Oh, admit it, there are more than that. Okay, so if you did not vote, you're wrong. You, you, <laughs> you, you, you cannot be right <laughs> if you did not vote. And now let me ask, who voted twice? Raise your hand. <laughs> so, so in this case, you're all right twice. <laughs> so, so in fact, so, so in fact, it turns out that these are, I mean, how can, you, how can you both be right? Well, you might notice that my questions had weasel words in it. I didn't say bigger. I said at least as big. Uh, and in fact, these two are ex exactly the same. And what do I mean by big? I could mean area. But I always think of this as a, I mean, mathematics, I, I, mathematics is an empirical science. Uh, so what do you do when you have a question like this? You try examples. You try it out. And you can imagine, at worst, you know, maybe uh, imagine a, you do this by hand or write a computer program. And the magical thing is every time you did it with different shapes, they would be exactly the same shape. And as soon as you did that, you'd realize it can't be the one and one and two. What matters is that it's uh, is that it be a doodle of size B and then a doodle of size A. You should get a doodle of size A plus B. And this is first an empirical, you should again say, I mean, this is a true fact. But first it's an empirical fact that we then want to try to understand. It's something we observe in the universe. Uh, and then we're forced to observe it because we were led to ask, this question and this question, and then we're led inevitably to this. And then in answering it, we're, we're, we're led to, uh, uh, we're inevitably led by this question you ask when you're five years old, one of the most fundamental ideas in mathematics, which is the triangle inequality, which is, again, something which, said correctly, a five-year-old understands, which is the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And, that, and the reason it's called the triangle inequality is if you're walking from point A to point C, uh, the fastest distance is that. So if you went by way of point B, it's going to take you at least as long. And the only way it'll take you exactly the same time if, is if B is en route. So, uh, uh, and so here's why the triangle inequality is, in effect, equivalent to this, uh, uh, to this theorem. Uh, so so let, let me start with our shape. And how do we show that n of a of n of b of x is equal to n of a plus b of x. Well, we, in essence, take our vote. And we check that both sides are actually right. And if this side contains this side, and this side contains this side, they must be the same. So let me just, uh, let me just do that. Uh, so why is everything in this set in this set? Well, the question is why, if I take a single step of size at most a plus b, why can I get there in a step of size b and a step of size a? That's not so hard. You can divide this in a ratio of b to a. Uh, and then you've taken two smaller steps. You anywhere you can get with one big step, you can get in two small steps. And then, and then the, for the other direction, if you take a step of size at most a, let's say a or b, I, and then a step of size a, how do you know that you can get there in a step of size at most a plus b? Well, that is the triangle inequality. 
So, so lo it's logically, in fact, equivalent in the sense that if you were to do a version of this on a different kind of space, this result is true if and only if the triangle inequality is true. So let me just sort of say it again, that a five-year-old question leads us inevitably to this, math, to, this, uh, uh, to, to this truth. OK, so now we're in this great situation that we've, we, we, that, that we've got this interesting fact, which actually didn't seem to be about our original question, but really it's going to help us. Because if we're going to do a doodle, and a doodle, and a doodle, and a doodle, we could, spend, we could do a million doodles in a row, or we could simply save time and do a single big doodle of size one million. And so we have a reworded question, uh, which is that uh, as, we, as, as we take a bigger and bigger doodle, and of course it doesn't matter that it's an integer, uh, it can't matter, then if we take a, do a bigger and bigger doodle, as r gets big, does it get more and more circular? And this question, it's still, I still don't know what this means yet. I, uh, I don't know the answer, I don't know what it means. I know the answer is going to be yes, <laughs> but I need to figure out what it means. And I want to point out again a bunch of things that the question got shorter. So we know we've made progress in mathematics and science when the question gets shorter. We've somehow gotten closer to the truth. And the other thing I want to point out is there's implicitly a limit, again, here in this question. And limits are something you, know, you learn about maybe in high school or college, but it's, it's sort of five-year-olds know what limits are. Not formally, but this notion, this intuition, is a very natural notion. OK, so now let me tell you why it's true. And I'm going to use, this, use a fact, which is I'm going to use repeatedly, so I want you to understand it, which is, uh, which is really uh, not a hard fact, but a, but, a remarkably, uh, uh, but a remarkably useful fact. So I've got a shape A set contained in another set B. And I wanna, if I doodle around A, and that doodle is contained inside the doodle around B. And that's just because, uh, the, uh, that's just because anything I can get to in a step from a point of A, of course I get to in a step from a point of B because every point in A is a point in B. So I want to make sure you get that. So nod your head up and down if you buy what I'm saying. OK, great. So you've, uh, OK, great. So this is, so let's, let's use this and see what happens. OK, so what I want to do is, is and again, what you should do whenever you see a, a theorem is you always, of course, look for the larger moral or the, or the mean that's good, uh, or the mathematical theme that's going on in it. And uh, so, so I've got a shape x I want to doodle around. Pick a point P and X, which I think of being near the center, but doesn't need to be. And I want to think about circles centered at P. And I want to let C sub T be the, uh, be the circle of radius T. And I want to pick an R around it. Uh, I want to pick an R around it. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe I should make that a capital R. Oh, no, I think that's fine. Uh, uh, so that X is inside C, the circle. So I've got a point inside X, inside a circle. And I'm going to doodle around these, these things. So, I doodle, so I'll doodle around x, but I, I'll simultaneously doodle around p and around the circle. Uh, and so, uh, so since p is an x, the doodle around p is in the doodle around x. You've already nodded your head that you're going to accept that. And, and you already agreed to this as well. But the doodle around a point is a circle. And the doodle around a circle is a bigger circle. So I can get, a, get rid of these terms here. And what we now have is that if capital R is a million, the a, a doodle of size a million is, uh, and little r is one, then if I were to draw this picture, then I've got a circle of radius a million. And I've got a circle of radius a million and one. And this is not to scale. Uh, <laughs> and, then, and then somehow the doodle is, is somehow wedged in between these two. And so as R gets, as a million gets really big, the border of, of this doodle is squeezed between circles between, whose ratio radii goes to one. We can make this precise if you want by the ratio of the biggest inscribed circle uh, to the smallest uh, circumscribed circle. And, so, and, that's, and, we, and we've answered the question. Th th that, that seems to me an excellent explanation of what it means to get more and more circular. So, so, we, so, we've an uh, so, so I want to point out one thing, which is that you may complain that I, only, I, de uh, I didn't know what getting more and more circular was. I declared what the answer was only after I finished the proof. But this is how science works. This is how uh, uh, sci nature tells you what the, terms, wh what the terms are, what the theorems are. You listen to nature, and often you only know what the theorem is at the end of the proof. Uh, and you only know in physics, I mean, the, the, for, I think in physics, for example, you had the notion of weight, and at some point in history, for good reason, post-Newton, weight and mass split, because nature was telling us that we should think that there are two fundamentally different notions, uh, and, and so it, Newton didn't say, that there's just one thing, it's just weight. Or Einstein told us that space was not the way we thought it was. When you listen to nature, we have to, pay, we have to change 
the way in which we talk about it. So the, so the theorems come often after the proofs. Okay, so I want to do more with this. Right, and so, uh, so now, so I want to doodle around, uh, keep doodling and look for, looking for patterns. So the, I'll doodle around simple shapes, and the simplest shapes are going to be convex polygons. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, convex just means no dense. So that's a convex polygon. And there's a non-convex polygon because it's got a big dent in it. And I'm going to ask a question. Now this gets to a question I saw when I was a little bit older. I, I'm not sure how old I was, maybe uh, 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 sometime in school, which is, which is the following question, which is, suppose you have a convex polygon. This is a, a, a pentagon, not a regular pentagon, but because I can't draw regular pentagons. But, uh, but uh, it's a pentagon. And I want to doodle around it. And so let me doodle around it. And I want to ask you how big, how, what's the perimeter of this doodle? And so, and you'll say, well, great, I need to know something about the Pentagon. I'll tell you, uh, I'm not going to tell you its side lengths, I'm not going to tell you its angles, but I will tell you I've measured its perimeter carefully, and it's, you check, its perimeter is actually P. So, uh, 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 so now I want to ask you, with that information, what is the perimeter of this doodle? So what's the, uh, what, so, so how, what is, with that limited bit of information, which clearly, it's always interesting when you have a question not knowing so, mu not knowing so much, what is the perimeter of this doodle? What's that? I heard, I heard a two, I heard a pi in there, I heard big noises. More than P, okay, it's more than P. So there's a, a lucky guess there. So someone made a very lucky guess of P plus two pi R, which is exactly right. Okay, what was behind that lucky guess? Uh, you go straight uh, along the straight edge, and then you start curving at each point, and the total arc length, total length of the curve. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and its coefficients have good meaning. So it's like it's this poly uh, so the constants the area we like the area. The, uh, the 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 linear term is the perimeter we like that, and the quadratic term is is pi. Everyone likes everyone likes pi. So I want to generalize. I'm going to generalize for the case where x is convex but not necessarily a polygon. So let's say you have a, an ellipse. And then maybe for reasons I'm going to possibly duck, uh, 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 well, you can try to figure out why I'm doing this. I want to change the definition. Uh, I don't, it's not necessary right now, but necessary in a second, where I want to walk around the outside of my shape. And I want to, and I've, I want to stick out my, the stick, which has left precisely r. And I want to walk clockwise and stick out my right arm. And there's a marker at the end of the pen, and that's, that's my doodle. So it's really equivalent in this case here, although I'll leave to you to figure out why it is. And then I have an empirical question of what happens. I care, the perimeter here is P, the area is A. What do we get? And the fact is that the same formula holds. Uh, and again, you should think of this as an empirical fact, and you should want to prove it. And then if you want to prove it, you might ask, I want to point out one thing, which is that, which is that his argument for the convex polygon breaks down completely. It does not apply. So I from one point of view, you'd say, well, the right argument, uh, there's an argument, for example, using Green's theorem. Uh, uh, and it's clever, but there's not so much intuition there. And so if from one point of view, it's absolutely the right argument. From another point of view, his, I mean, I I I his argument is so nice. I feel like, you know, how could something so right be so wrong? And what you want to do is perhaps is, have a, uh, is to try to make it precise. And when you try to make it precise, it's a longer-winded proof. But you're following in the footsteps of Leibniz, of, of Leibniz and, and Newton in constructing it. That's how the calculus was, was created. And I think there's a lot to be said for, uh, for, for thinking about it in that way, too. OK, so now let me go back in time to another question, which I heard perhaps when I was 10, uh, which is the following question, which is, which is the following, which is, okay, for the purpose of this, uh, for the purpose of this uh, puzzle, the Earth's a perfect sphere. And so string is wrapped around the equator of the Earth. Uh, and then someone comes along, cuts the string, uh, adds precisely one meter more of string, and then suspends it above the equator at a constant height. Uh, and the question is, how high off the ground is the string when you do this? Uh, and I'm going to ask for a vote on this again. Or is it closer to a millimeter, a micrometer, uh, or a nanometer? So, so this is a, so, so, this, so is it closer to a millimeter, or a micrometer, or a nanometer. And now you know for sure that if you don't, uh, that, that you can't be right all three times. Uh, 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 but if you don't vote, you're guaranteed to be wrong too. So, uh, uh, so to answer this question, you, you may reasonably say this isn't fair because you don't know how big the Earth is. You need to not to answer the question. And I've got to say that you, know, you live here, so this is something you should be able to, <laughs> you, you should have some idea of how big the Earth is. Um, OK, so now I'm ready for the vote. So how many people think that, well, let me repeat the question to be clear what it is. Uh, which is uh, string around the equator, someone cuts it, adds exactly one meter more, levitates it above the Earth. How high is it above the Earth? Okay. Is it a question? Or? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Great. So who, who thinks it's closer to, uh, closer to, to a millimeter? And then closer to a micrometer? And closer to a nanometer? So it's actually pretty, pretty even. Okay, so pretty even. Now I'll tell you the answer, which is that it's actually closer to a millimeter, and, and in fact, it's way, uh, uh, the way the boats were going, you think it's really small, but it's really big, but it's, it's one over two pi, it's, it's about this much, one over two pi meters, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, so the, so let me draw a picture of this, and this is, of course, not the way a 10-year-old would solve this question. Uh, the, uh, all you need to know is the cir circumference of a circle. Uh, but somehow, seeing these questions from a more advanced standpoint can be, kind of, can be really enlightening. So there's the Earth, say. Uh, and then let's say, again, not to scale, here's the string levitating above the Earth. And then this looks very much like one of our duties. So we have, uh, so, so the, we have the perimeter of the Earth, and we don't know what that is, really. And we know that the perimeter of the doodle uh, is equal to the perimeter of the Earth uh, plus 2 pi r, where r is the size of the doodle. It's exactly the thing we're looking for. Now, if I were to put everything on one side, that's the amount of string added, one meter. And so uh, r is 1 over 2 pi. And the great thing is it's independent of p. This is true on Mars and on Jupiter. But there's even, that's something you, that's the cool thing you see when you're 10, that it doesn't matter what the size is. But, you know, I have uh, interesting news for the pure mathematicians. 
The Earth is not a perfect sphere. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, and it's also not a basketball. Uh, and uh, and the, the, the great thing about this argument is it doesn't matter if the Earth is a perfect sphere. This works exactly the same. All this use is that the fact that the Earth is convex. And in fact, the Earth, even another factor that's still happening is the Earth is not convex. But, the, uh, but, but, but when you wrap spring around the Earth, you will get the convex hull. So in fact, this is always true on any asteroid, on any, uh, of, of, of any shape. And that's sort of the bonus fact. OK, so let's see what else this, this, this force is on us. Uh, the, so what happens, so if, if we give up convexity, then that's, we gradually, we do what mathematicians do in relaxed conditions and see what happens. Uh, and so there's something which is non-convex. Non uh, it's got a big dent in it. And when I do, I do a doodle around it, it starts to cross itself. And again, now it matters that I'm, uh, uh, that I'm, uh, uh, that I'm sticking my hand out. And now, again, I do the same thing. I ask what's the perimeter and what's the area. And I write a computer program to empirically test this out. And the same formula holds. The perimeter formula is exactly right. And then I work out the formula of the area. Well, what do I mean by area? Well, uh, this shouldn't count, of course. That's not in the doodle. Well, I'll count everything else. And, when I, and the, the computer tells me that the area is, is not right. The formula no longer holds. Uh, and then if you think about it a little bit, you realize that what really you need to do is count this area twice. It wants to overlap itself. So, and then the formula holds. And the way you should think about this is this is area of multiplicity. And this is forced upon you by nature. This is us uh, So we did this doodle, and we're forced to discover this notion of area of multiplicity. That nothing, uh, and how do we know it's the right notion? It's because the formula is work. How do we know that mass is the right notion in physics? It's because it makes the theory nice. Uh, and now, to, to see whether you buy this, let me, let me ask a question for you, and then get a, get a suggestion, which is, how about a figure eight? So, so here's a figure eight. Let's walk around the figure eight. Uh, and this is, this is non-convex in a kind of a more serious way. So I'll doodle around it, but now the doodle goes inside. And now I write my computer program to work at the perimeter, and something cool happens. Something, the perimeter has a nice formula, but it's a different formula. We, get the, we lost the pi, we lost the 2 pi r. That's gone. And we do the area formula, and actually we, we do the area, and again, but we don't get a nice formula. It just does not turn out to be nice. But I will tell you that when you define the area correctly, you, you get a nice formula. So my question for you is, what is the formula? Uh, so I'll tell you that what the area is not. It's not, the area of the figure eight obviously should be this, but it's not that. So what does the area of the figure eight want to be? Exactly, exactly. It should be one section, this minus that. And the great thing to think about this is a, as the initial, when someone proposes something, it's a guess, there's nothing wrong with a, it's an educated guess, there's nothing wrong with a guess being wrong, but you want the guess because even if it's wrong, you can move towards a correct understanding. So we have a guess, we plug it into the computer, we say, what is the area of this minus this? It turns out that it, is, it always behaves nicely. So this tells you that this is what area wants to be. So in particular, signed area is forced upon us by doing this doodle and asking natural questions. And maybe a, fo a follow-up question is we lost the pi r squared, so nature is trying to tell us something else. And so here, uh, uh, so here is a more complicated shape. So, uh, so, so, the, so here's a more complicated shape, and it's uh, there's the shape. And now let me doodle around it. There we go. And then we can ask, uh, and, and, and then I'll tell you what the perimeter is, and uh, and it's that. Uh, and then I'll tell you what the area is. But then we need to define the area correctly, and I will tell you the answer. But I won't, uh, uh, which is that this is a this wants to be counted twice, which you can perhaps believe. And so again, area's multiplicity is forced on us. Uh, and look, we didn't get a two pi r, we got a four pi r. We didn't get a two pi r, a pi r squared, we got a two pi r squared. So th this, is, this is in fact the winding number of the path. And let me just say briefly what the winding number is. If you haven't seen it, but you very well might have, it's sort of a concept in math, in electricity and magnetism, um, in topology. So basically what happens is I'm gonna walk around the path and you look net how many times I turn. So when I go around here, and I go around the little loop, and I go around the big loop, then, uh, then that's, I, I do a net of two turns. Whereas if I went around a figure eight, I, I do a net of zero turns. And that explains the zero. So this is something where I'm telling you the answer, but you want, to, you want to prove why it's true. And a sign of a good understanding, here's the question that you have to want to answer, which is if I were to do some incredibly complicated thing like this, here's a question for you. 
what multiplicity does that area, does that region want to be counted with? And secondly, what's this mystery number here? And thirdly, why is the derivative of this still equal to this? So there are these questions you can't help but want to know, not the answer to, just the answer to, but, uh, but why things are true. Okay, great. So, so, so now you're going to generalize four, more. So here's a question with oops. Uh, uh, so, uh, so, so here's a question. So here's a question if you're doodling, I think this doodling in geography class, not in math. So here's a so here's a something in geography, which is this is Hawaii. There's the big island that's got a volcano, a little island in there. Uh, it's just, uh, you can see why I did not become a geographer. Uh, the, uh, and so if you doodle around it, then again, you, you can work out what the... So I'm going to answer the question again in kind of a different way. If I hadn't already lost my blue marker, I would just look more like water in the, in the sea. But maybe. Uh, but, so it turns out that the area, the perimeter is the derivative of this, is the area of the original shape plus the perimeter times r plus some mystery integer times pi r squared. And so we already answered the mystery integer in terms of winding number, but I want to say it in a different way, which is it's the number of pieces, the number of islands minus the number of holes. So here we have four islands and one hole. And this is the Euler characteristic, which is, the, uh, which is one of the most fundamental notions, perhaps the most fundamental notion in topology that you often see in a first graduate course in topology. And I want to point out that you're forced to this notion, this integer, when you ask this question in geography class in third grade. It's enough, it's, uh, and you ask natural questions about how big it is, what's, what's the length. Okay, and then if you want to generalize more, I have to say that the very natural way that we always want to generalize is in dimensions. Uh, and so if you do a lot in two dimensions, you might think the next thing to generalize to do is to do three dimensions. And I want to say that's the wrong question. The first thing you should always do is generalize downwards. So that my, my rhetorical question for you is what happens in one dimension? And you might begin to get surprisingly confusing to try to make sense of, of all these statements. Uh, uh, I mean, winding number can't make sense. What happens in one dimension? And then, of course, the goal is to figure out what happens in n dimensions. Okay, so rather than going, uh, so, so rather than, so, so rather than going to, uh, to one dimension, I will go to three. And so let's experiment and let's doodle. We need to make sense of, of doodling. So here's how I'm going to make sense of doodling. Uh, here's how I'm going to make sense of doodling in, in, th in three dimensions. I'm going to go back to my definition of all the points within distance r of it. So think of this as here's a box, of, of, uh, and I've measured it before coming in, and the length was l, the height is h, and the width is w. Uh, and so I, I imagine a dust cloud of, of size exactly r around the box. It's like uh, you know, pig pen in, in Charlie Brown. Uh, it's, uh, I, and, so, uh, and so my question is, what is the volume of this dust cloud? Uh, and let me tell you the answer, because the, the uh, so, so his answer in dimension two tells us, again, how we should proceed in a more general case. So what did we do? Or maybe I'll think of it as, 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 a, as clay, you have this clay shape. And, and what I have here uh, when I, uh, is, what makes up the clay? Well, there's the volume, uh, there's the inside, there's, there's, which is really the volume. And then I also have these slabs of clay on the faces. So I get, uh, so I get the surface area times r, uh, which is 2h, uh, I won't write that out. But, uh, uh, so, and then you also have, around the corners, you've got these little octants of spheres, which I can fit together to make a single, uh, to make a single sphere. And that's the answer, so you get this nice answer. Ah, great, okay, so, uh, great, uh, great, so I was lying. Uh, and uh, so, I, so what am I, what, what am I, someone else, then what am I, what am I, what did I miss? Where did my, what was that, I heard, yeah? Yeah, yeah you, you, what's that? Ah, the cylinder, great, great. Not just the, he even said what they were, they're going to be cylinders. That, they're, that, that on here you have these little quarter cylinders. And it, it's interesting to point out a couple of things, which is if you ask people, if I had more time, I would have asked you to say this, and often, to tell me what this is, and often that's the one that gets missed. Oh, let me first say what the answer is again. He said, you have little quarter cylinders on each edge, and then they come together in fours. We get one cylinder in this edge direction by combining these four, and similar in, similarly with each of the others, and we get the actual answer. Which is which is this, uh, and uh, yeah. and and, uh, and so it's interesting that this is a tricky one, and this the, the reasons for it. I don't know. It's a non-mathematical statement. There's reasons for this being a complicated one. So once you do this, you might try this for a sphere, and once again you'll get a similar kind of formula: the volume plus surface area times r plus fourth of pi r two plus this 
from here. And I want to say that if you can imagine these empirically, take a convex body in general, like this, uh, like, uh, like, like this, like this dodecahedron, and then maybe work out what it is, at least uh, empirically, and you get, something, uh, you get something which is, again, you have to squint. You see a lot of letters, but really a lot of them are constant. These are, you always get the volume plus surface area times r plus further uh, power cube plus some mystery number times r squared. And you can calculate it for a sphere. And it's not, you could believe, I mean, it's height plus length plus width times pi for a box. It's something else for a sphere. It, we know the meaning of three of the coefficients. They have, they, and you've got to believe that if you like volume and area in the, a unit sphere, there's a third, there's a fourth relative of these three in there somewhere. And this is really the Euler characteristic, too. So there's some third thing, and the fourth thing in there that, that is trying to tell us that it should be really important. So, okay, so let me tell you how it's important to give you a sign of how to think about these things. And now I'll tell you one of, the, one of my favorite problems of all time. Uh, this one I heard when I was in high school. Uh, uh, and so this one, this one, as with many beautiful problems, this comes from Russia. Uh, I've heard arguments whether it comes from St. Petersburg or Moscow, so I'm not going to get into that. Uh, but uh, but the, the problem is this, that a Russian train company has this rule that you're not allowed packages in a box uh, whose sum of dimensions, whose sum of the height plus width plus length is more than what are one meter. Uh, and that one meter is arbitrarily picked. And the question is, let's say you have a box, uh, which is illegal. Is it possible that you could cheat by, by putting it uh, in a larger box? So if this, is a, if, if, if this has too big height plus length plus width, can you cheat by putting it in a bigger box? And of course, if you were to nestle it in a corner, you can't win. You can't cheat because the smaller one will have a smaller height, smaller length, smaller width. But maybe, just maybe, there's some diagonal way of fitting an illegal box in a legal box. Uh, and maybe that's a good way of, uh, uh, that, that's the way you can cheat. So before I go on, I want to say that you may again think it's a contrived problem that it's really a, a crazy, you know, what kind of crazy Russian rule is this for, for trains? Uh, so in flying here, I flew on United. Uh, and if you look at the carry-on baggage rules, the carry-on baggage may not exceed a maximum of 45 linear inches high plus length plus width. So this is, uh, <laughs> this is, <laughs> so this is you know, really applied mathematics. It's a, exactly, exactly. It's a, uh, uh, and, okay, so can you, win? and the, one thing you should know is that if you know, I guess in The Princess Bride, you, you never argue about death with the Sicilian, you never argue with mathematics with the Russian. Uh, the, uh, so, so, so you know that the so, so you know that the Russian is right at anything mathematical. So you know you can't win, and the question is why can't why, why can't you win? And so here's so here's the reason why. And the great thing about this is this is this is a, a proof a solution that sneaks up on you when you don't expect it. it just sort of uh, you do one thing, and all of a sudden it just sort of appears out of nowhere. Uh, and there often there are other ways of doing it that are really 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 painful. Peter Winkler has an amazing book and uh, with lots of beautiful solutions, but this one he ends up solving in a, in a painful way. Um, so here's, so here's, here's how we do it. So we have X and Y are boxes, and suppose you have a box inside a bigger box, so one your maybe illegal box inside your legal box. And then when you doodle around X, the dust cloud around X is contained in the dust cloud around Y. This is the thing that you nodded your head about. You've already bought it, you can't take it back. So you've, uh, so you've already agreed with this, um, even if the boxes are somehow tilted. And you've already even corrected me on the, on the volume of the doodles. So there's the, the volume, the doodle around x has, has uh, this volume. The doodle around y has this volume. And I just, when you see this, you just can't help yourself right, to cancel these out. Uh, and so now, again, these are, r is the variable, everything else is a number. And what do we do? We do exactly what we did when we were five years old. We keep doodling, we let r go to infinity. We look at the large r limit. And this is a, this is a quadratic, polynomial, this is a quadratic polynomial, and this guy's always bigger. And the only way he can always be bigger is if, is if his leading term is always at least as big. Uh, otherwise, he would eventually pass him. And so there are the leading terms, and then I can't help myself. And then that's it. It's all over. So, uh, so, it's a, so, it's a, so I, I really, every time I do it, I get shivers down my spine. That's a, uh, uh, okay, so, so, so clearly these things. Uh, so, so, so clearly these things actually. Uh, clearly these things actually. Uh, these things actually relate to. Uh, uh, are potentially useful, and maybe you thought that was just a fun problem. So I'll say another fun problem, relating to the same thing. So to say it again, we've got this relative 
of volume area and uh, volume and area that in three dimensions. And of course, at some point we want to go to n dimensions, and I'll go there in a bit. But let me say, even with this mysterious relative of area, this is a, a, like a, I think it's like a three uh, three dimensional like a thing, a two dimensional thing, and a one dimensional invariant in uh, uh, a three dimensional shapes. So here's a related Hilbert problem. Hilbert, as as many of you know, uh, David Hilbert was uh, perhaps the greatest mathematician of his time and this dawn of the 20th century. He proposed 23 problems that were intended to, in some sense, direct, the, uh, d uh, direct mathematics in the next century. One of the first problem to be solved was this one. Um, and so his problem, was, uh, his problem was, was based on this, which is if I were to say, um, which is if I were to say, can you cut up this triangle and rearrange the pieces to make this square, and I, I mean honestly cutting, no Bonnock Tarski nonsense with, uh, with, with, uh, with, 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 with the actual scissors uh, in straight edge cuts. Could you do it? And you quickly say no, and I'd say why not? And you say, well, this one is bigger. In other words, explicitly, we have an invariant called area, and that's preserved by cutting and pasting. And so there's no way you can do it. So of course, then I will come back and say, here's a square of exactly the same area. Now can you do it? Uh, and then you think about it for a while, and then at some point you would you would come up with something maybe like this. And then maybe, OK, now, OK. This is maybe a bad idea, but I'm going to see what I can do. Uh, great, there's the square. And then the triangle. And there's the triangle. And then, of course, you feel very proud of yourself. But then I come back and I. Uh, then, I do more, uh, then I do more, I give you an octagon, uh, and then I give you a pentagon. At some point, you realize you want to prove a theorem, and pretty quickly, well, not pretty quickly, there's a very slick, quick way of showing that in two dimensions, there's no problem. Any two shapes you have uh, of the same area, you can cut and paste. To, to, uh, and then the question comes, well, what about 3D? And then we have, we have the problem, which is, he, which is, of course, Hilbert gave a specific case, which is, which is if you have a cube and a tetrahedron of the same volume, then can you, but please don't do this with my uh, Rubik's cube, but, uh, uh, but can you cut this up into pieces and rearrange it to form this? And the answer is you cannot, and the reason is because there's another invariant, exactly one more invariant besides volume. It's something else, and what this is is some version of this one-dimensional invariant. It's, a, it's a, not exactly it, but it's a pumped up version of it, uh, uh, which exactly tells you when you can cut, uh, cut, uh, cut, this up, uh, cut things up in 3D. OK, so now let me say briefly what these, uh, what these invariants are. Uh, oh, first, let me say that then in dimension n, of course, we want to eventually get into, uh, we want to think about things in vast generality, being mathematicians. Uh, and so in dimension n, if you have an n-dimensional thing, and again, I have a lot of questions here. Depending on what you know, you may actually try to see if you can answer why these, figure out why these are true. But if you were to do a doodle in n space, uh, and again, I'm gonna, I, I, I left my five-dimensional shape at home, so I can't show it to you. But, uh, but you can imagine that if I have my five-dimensional thing here, uh, and you doodle around it in five-dimensional spa space, uh, it turns out that the size of the doodle is a polynomial, of size r, is a polynomial of dimension n. And the coefficients, well, the constant term is the hypervolume. The linear term is the hypersurface area. And then the, ma the top term is the, is the unit hyper, the volume of the unit hypersphere. So these are definitely fundamental uh, things, but that means that they're all, there's now there's more than one bonus volume type thing. There's a whole bunch in here. And these higher invariants, this is nature trying to tell us something. It must mean something. We've already seen in dimension three in various ways how they, how, how they come into play. So I want to, I'd like to, uh, so, so I'd like to tell you how to think of these in a different way. And then I want to give you an example of how these invariants actually get used, or uh, this kind of thinking gets used in things that, that people are thinking about even today. So let me first tell you what these are in a, different, in a different way. What are these mystery invariants, and how do you think about it? Well, let me redo. I want to revisit the things we thought we understood well and see them in a new way. For, uh, so let me revisit, in two-dimensional space, the one-dimensional invariant, which is the perimeter. And so, ra uh, so, so rather than... So the one-dimensional invariant of this was described as being, uh, was the perimeter. And I'm going to describe perimeter in a weird way. Wh wh what I want to do is take the average length of a shadow of it. So think about this as there's a, there is a, uh, 
there, so imagine that you have, it's a shadow in an average direction, in, uh, uh, and then imagine that maybe I put a pin through it and I spin it around, and I take the average shadow here, that looks like the shadow there, I take the average shadow and multiply it by pi, and you get the, you get the perimeter of it. And so that's already a new fact, and that's a, hard, not so, yeah, that's a question for you. How do you, why is that true? And so as an example, a circle of radius r always has a shadow uh, of, of, area of length 2r, whoops, of length 2r, so its perimeter is 2 pi r. And so, that, so and maybe uh, if, if you work this out, it'll be a trig interval. And now I'll tell you one secret now that you're past, I think, hopefully there are no freshmen in this room. Uh, that, that sort of the way professors make up exams in freshman calculus, at least the wise ones, what I, is, is you give questions where you have a slick, easy answer to know what the answer is. So you can do it really quickly. And your students have to do lots of algebra to work it out. And this is one of these that, uh, uh, one of these that I, uh, this is an example of that. Okay, so let me, let me ask you a question, which is, uh, what's the average, the shadow of a, uh, what's the average shadow of a line segment of length one? So if I were to take a, uh, take a little stick here, let's see, uh, well, my stick is somewhere else, so I won't bother trying to find it. Ah, here it is. And I, uh, and I were to take its average shadow uh, onto this line, what is the, what's the average length of a shadow? Again, something which you could turn into a freshman calculus problem, but we want to avoid calculus. What, what's that? Yeah, half, half. It's more than that, uh, or not quite that anyway. I know it's not for, for rationality reasons. And the key to that is what's the perimeter of this stick? So what does the perimeter of a stick want to be? This should be, and it's not one, two, right. So the perimeter of the stick is two, and that means that the average shadow should be two over pi. And so, the, uh, uh, and so you can turn that into integral and you realize that this is great. I did know, I did know, I did know figure integral there. Uh, and so in particular, the average length of the shadow of a one inch toothpick is that. And this connects to, uh, I just want to mention it really briefly, that, that uh, Buffon's needle problem uh, is, uh, is, 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 there's this ancient experimental method of determining the value of pi. What you do is you, you put, draw a lot of lines of length exactly one apart, and you just drop a bunch of needles of length one, and you see how often a needle meets a line. This is not a very effective way of computing the digits of pi, but, it's, uh, but, the, but the, the odds of crossing a line are two over pi, and it's, it's for, basically this, for basically this reason. Okay, so now we've redone this, and then that suggests what we should do uh, in, in higher dimension, which is uh, n equals three, if you have a two-dimensional invariant, the, uh, uh, which we, that's surface area. Here's a different way of thinking about surface area. The average, you consider the average area of the shadow of a convex body and multiply it by four. So for example, if you have a sphere of radius, uh, of, of radius r, then its shadow is pi r squared, and the surface area is four pi r squared. Bingo, really fast. Uh, and, but this is true, this is true for any convex shape as well. And, and, and just as an interesting, uh, so, it, and this is not so easy. A, a question is like, prove this for a box. And this is really not so easy to prove that the average shadow of a box is, uh, uh, is four times its surface area. Uh, and then this actually, I should say, these things actually get used. And I should say, now we're finding, so, uh, so here's a way in which it has been used that I've heard about, which is rather entertaining, which is, you know, I, I, so yeah, uh, when I grew up, there were nine, only nine planets. Uh, and then we lost one. But we, uh, but we gain, we, we, but now we're in this happy situation of discovering just, we, have, we know about huge numbers of planets, uh, although there's somehow air bars around the number of planets we know. And how do we know about these planets? Uh, 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 well, uh, in general, the, the, uh, I'm not sure if this is the, the, the current way, but at least as of a few years ago, what happens is if you have a star and you're, uh, and you're very lucky and the, the planet was going around the star and its plane of the ecliptic was lined up with us, then the, star then the planet would occlude the star every so often uh, and so you would be able to notice the star getting dimmer every so often. And you'd know, how, you'd know how long it takes to go around the star by just seeing how often it would dim. But you also get, in effect, the, uh, the, the size of the planet by way of its surface area. And you really get a, a reasonable approximation of its surface area by just multiplying the, the amount that's depleted by, by four. So, they, so, th so this is something which, was, which, which they actually use. And now we come to the one-dimensional invariant. Uh, which is this thing, which is pi times h plus l, w plus l. What is this for a box? It's a, or what is it in general? We know we can work it out for a sphere, but what is it for, what is it for a weirder shape? And the answer is, you take its average, uh, the average length of its shadow on a one-dimensional sphere. 
So, uh, so, not a, so, it's a, so you take a one-dimensional shadow, so onto the z-axis, say. Take its average and then multiply by a certain constant. What is the constant? Well, you can use the sphere to work out what the constant is. And so again, this, is, this lets you really know what it is in any dimension. The k-dimensional and the n-dimension is basically the same thing. But then, again, you're welcome to try to, you can actually try to p figure this out. OK, so now let me just end by, uh, by telling you an example of, of how this is used uh, how this is used today, uh, or how, they, how these ideas come up today, uh, in, in things related to, to, to things that I'm used to thinking about. So what I'm going to describe uh, is about spaces. So we've talked about, so you know what curves are. Uh, and so not surprisingly, the notion of surfaces, especially surfaces like this, which are uh, closed, oriented, compact, but pictures like this. This is something with three holes, the genus is three. Uh, and these shapes, with a bit of additional structure, complex structure, or the notion of distance, or the notions of angles, these all end up being the same. Uh, uh, so elliptic curves are examples of these. So I should say, for what's going to happen now is I'm going to wave my hands a little bit, because I know people, different people know different things. And I want to say things that most of you have no right to know, but I want to give you a, an impression of, of how to think about these things. Now, when you add complex structures on it, or, shape, or notions of distance, then, then you get something which are called Riemann surfaces. They come up, for example, in string theory, where uh, when strings tra travel through, uh, w when strings move, they sweep out a shape like this, uh, and they come with a complex structure. So uh, it may, for many reasons, when you solve a bunch of polynomials with complex coefficients, you, get, you can get these things. And you can ask, what uh, the first thing you, when you have when you have a mathematical topic, a notion, is you ask, what are they? What are the vector spaces? What are the, and if you, and the, the, there's only one Riemann sphere. But it turns out that there can be bunches of these things. There's more than one. Then you ask, well, what are these things? There's a set of these things. And, uh, and Riemann knew that in some sense, there was, th in some sense, there was, there were, uh, there's a three, or maybe I should, depending on how you count dimensions, uh, six G minus six dimensional real family, or six, three G minus three complex family. They come in a, a family of that big. And maybe you can ask what happens when G is zero, things get interesting. But let me duck that question. And then David Mumford got a Fields Medal uh, for, and the, the, the thing he was most cited for at that time was making sense of the sense that this is a space. There's, a, there's really a space of such things, uh, which is called the moduli space of, of, of Riemann surfaces. Uh, that, that, that we can think of it as not just a set, but, the, that, but something you navigate around. Uh, and then Deline and Mumford, Deline got the Fields me field Medal not just for this, but for many other things as well. But Deline also got the Pills Medal for, for things related to this, where they define even a new kind of space to make sense of what this was. And, and so there's a, some space which is smooth, uh, in some sense, uh, that this is. And then once you have a space, it has a notion of size. You want to know its shape. So you have questions about its shape and size. Uh, and Ed Witten, uh, who also got a Fields Medal, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, so he's a physicist at the Institute for Advanced Study. But as a physicist, he's a better mathematician than, than almost any mathematician alive. Uh, so he, this is post his Fields Medal, using, idea, using intuition from string theory, he said something really rather radical, that, he, that the shape of this space, uh, uh, the topology of the space, which is captured by various constants, by numbers, the shape of the space, these numbers, satisf are, are, he could tell you what all the numbers were by connecting these numbers to something in a completely different part of mathematics, uh, be it string theory, integral systems, there's different ways, representation theory, different ways of saying this. And there seemed to be no possible reason for this. David Mumford has described this the fact that God, God cranked called Witten in his office at the Institute, told him this conjecture, and then hung up on him before he could ask any questions. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, uh, so soon after, Maxim Kinsevich, who got a Fields Medal for this proof, uh, was able to prove Witten's conjecture. Uh, and then later on, Andrei Akunkov and Rahul Pandey gave a second proof. Akunkov got a Fields Medal. <laughs> So as you can see, this, these are very these are these are non-trivial things that people were were, were doing here. Uh, and since then, there have around, been around seven proofs, each of which is a sign of a of an amazing statement that every proof somehow tells you something different and really is, is, is no one really trumps any other. And so what I want to tell you about now is a, a PhD thesis of Maria Mirzakhani from about a decade ago. I, I, and so, uh, and so her. Uh, so her thesis was, w so as you see, a lot of very clever people have been thinking about these questions. 
And so it's sort of very high risk to, 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 to attempt to work in this area. Uh, but her thesis, like in, 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 in pure mathematics, I think the best theses often appear in one of maybe the three top journals in mathematics. Her thesis was so amazing that it was cut from the three theses, and each one went to a different one of the top three journals. And, and, and so here, here's what she did to really sort of destroy this entire area uh, and, uh, and completely transform how we, how we think about it. Uh, so, so, so here's what she said. She said that, okay, we want, uh, there's a question, other question about, about how big this space is. Uh, and so what she said is, well, okay, well, wh let me ask a more general question where I, uh, I allow myself to cut holes in these surfaces, and then I can glue them together. So if I've got a bunch of holes uh, in these surfaces, well, they have sizes. Let me call them R1 through Rn. And the, uh, the, so what, what she did first is she worked out that you could, uh, that the volume of the space of the space with holes, she was able to show it's a magic polynomial. Just like, the, just like that question in, five, in any number of dimensions, the size of the dust cloud is a magic polynomial. So, so it's some magic polynomial. Uh, she knows that it is a polynomial. Second, she, how did she get it, what, work out what that is? She figured out how to cut the space into pieces, which is just like his argument in two dimensions, which then led us in the right direction in higher dimension as well. She, she, she was able to cut it into pieces. How? By cutting surfaces into pieces. To, uh, in this, uh, and so you, she could pick off, she had this recursive way of picking off things so you can sort of cut a surface into, into various holes. So then she had a cutting, just like we did, into pieces. So the volume is a magic polynomial. Cut, she cut it, she figured out how to cut it into pieces. And so in particular, she'd solved the conjecture uh, or answered a question from, uh, a central question from four, that was open for 40 years of what the volume of the space was. She could tell you any one of them. But then she said, okay, I've got this magic polynomial, and I know, or she knows, she, uh, she knew that the leading coefficient, what, what if with a doodle, you, you just start doodling, and you do finite doodles, and you realize a lot of the information is what happens when the circle gets really big. When you're five years old, you doodle, 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 and something nice happens. When you saw the Russian problem, you had the dust clouds, we let the dust clouds go to infinity. So she, it's a leading coefficient that really matters. So she was able to show then that the leading coefficient was something magical, and the magical things that they were were precisely the things Witten was talking about. And then her cutting into pieces precisely completely explained this. So, so, so she then simultaneously figured out what the volume was, connected to this, proved this conjecture, and it all ended up being extremely uh, slick as I guess elegant. It was, it, it was, it, it was, it, it simplified so much of what, of, of what happened before. Okay, so let me, let me just sum up and tell you what, and just point out what happened here, which is I, I spent this hour on one doodle, which is, uh, and just, and the question, and uh, so, and just ask questions that you can't help but, but ask it. So you just start doing this, and you do it again, and you, and this is really what I think, this is a proxy for nature. It's something out there, and you notice patterns. You think, I wonder why, you know, is this true? Can I empirically test it? Uh, why is it true? And then once you figure out what might be true, then this leads you to ask other questions, and then you get other techniques. And they're useful elsewhere, and it kind of builds on, uh, uh, things build in this way. And this, to me, really is what mathematics is about, which is, uh, which is a finding, looking, for, looking in nature for patterns, trying to find, the, the, ask the, asking the right questions, and then proving the things you discover, and then asking new questions based on that. So, so behind mathematics, even as trivial as a doodle, you can see things that are incredibly beautiful and powerful. We've seen, again, we've seen things from, uh, we saw the triangle inequality early on, we saw, uh, so we, we saw things from electricity and magnetism and topology, the other characteristic. We, uh, we saw things from string theory. We saw one of the Hilbert problems. We saw this beautiful Russian problem. Various puzzles fell into this uh, framework as well. So, uh, so to me, this is the best thing about mathematics. How it kind of is a grand unification theory for all these amazing things. Okay, so thank you very much for your time.